Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, I've been invited to uh, speak to you today about the rule of law. Uh, and I do so gladly because I believe observance of the rule of law is fundamental to any civilized society. But I also do so with some trepidation because I feel myself to some extent an outsider here today. Uh, I've been coming here frequently since the 1980s. I have great affection for Hong Kong and its people. And I'm very proud now to play a role in Hong Kong's International Arbitration Center and to visit my firm's office here. But I can't claim, uh, though, that I am of Hong Kong. And I recognize that there are others who have greater legitimacy and knowledge to express opinions about the issues facing Hong Kong today. So for that reason, I want to be circumspect about any statement I make about the current protest. Like all right-minded people, I deeply and sincerely hope that it will end peacefully and therefore commend the restrained response of the authorities. Uh, I don't want to take sides, but I will have to make some statements of a more general nature about the rule of law. Let me just make, if I may, this clear. Uh, as well as being a practicing lawyer, uh, I continue as an active member uh, of the upper house of the British Parliament, uh, the House of Lords, and sit on its Constitution Committee, which is concerned with some of the issues I will talk about today. But uh, everything I say today is simply said in a personal capacity. But as the rule of law uh, is now a matter of universal interest reflected in many local and international statements, I hope what I have to say is of value in considering these issues. And further, I've had indeed to think hard about the rule of law, especially during my time as Attorney General of the United Kingdom. I took office three months to the day before the atrocity of 9-11. Uh, and served thereafter through a turbulent and difficult period. It was an unprecedented, a challenging time. But one of the issues it gave rise to was whether you could continue to observe the rule of law but still do what was necessary to combat a grievous threat from terrorism. I became increasingly of the view that upholding the rule of law was not an obstacle to tackling that challenge of terrorism, but was a key part of a successful strategy for dealing with it. It enables us to show, for example, that our values are stronger and better than those of the terrorists because our values are more just, more fair, more equal than a doctrine of hatred and extremism peddled by extremists and other hate mongers. So what then is the rule of law? That's actually a more difficult question than it sounds. The expression rule of law is generally attributed to Professor A.V. Dicey, the Vinerian Professor of Law at Oxford University, in his book, An Introduction to the Study of Law of the Constitution, published in 1885. In fact, he didn't invent the idea lying behind it, nor even was he the first to use the expression as Lord Bingham, senior, former senior law lord of the United Kingdom, uh, in his highly influential book, The Rule of Law, published in 2010, demonstrated. And though the expression is in wide and repeated use, there's less agreement as to what it actually means. Dicey identified three meanings of the rule of law, the first two of which, I would venture to suggest, would remain universally accepted that no man should be penalized, save for a breach of an established law enacted under authority and tried before the ordinary courts of the land, and that the law applies to all, including the government, which, like a private citizen, can be held, account, can be held to account before the ordinary courts for breaches of the established law. Dicey's third meaning of the rule was peculiarly English one, which contrasted the English common law approach with that of countries with written constitutions, and I think it's no longer uh, 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 in date. But since then, many have attempted their own definitions of the rule of law. Lord Bingham, for example, found eight principles of the rule of law, as opposed to Dicey's three. 
other commentators and judges have argued for different formulations and content. The most lively debate is over the question whether the rule of law is concerned only with the formal aspects of the law. What is its source? Is it clear? Is it accessible and predictable so that people can judge their conduct by it? Is it applied evenly? Is determination of breach by the ordinary courts of the land? Or whether the rule of law is also concerned with the content of the law, that the rule of law distinguishes between just and unjust laws, that there are certain principles and values which need to be reflected in the law itself. Well, the view of many distinguished common law jurists, at least, is that the rule of law is not only concerned with formal aspects, but with the substance too. Lord Bingham was one of those. He argued the case in the book I've referred to by asking whether a state which savagely repressed or persecuted sections of its people could be regarded as observing the rule of law because that treatment and the atrocities, for example, transportation to a Nazi concentration camp, was the subject of detailed laws duly examined and scrupulously observed. And in reaching that conclusion, Bingham relied on a statement of the president of the Constitutional Court of the Russian Federation at a symposium in 2007 when he declared, and I quote, law can't simply be what is dictated by political authority or issued by the state. And President Zorkin, the president of the Constitutional Court of the Russian Federation, illustrated that point by reference to events both in Nazi Germany and in Stalin's Soviet Union, where he pointed to the fact that millions of people had died uh, because, as he put it, the law was given and contained in the statutes. In other words, he was saying, and Bingham was saying, that rule by law is not the same as rule of law. And so Bingham included amongst his eight principles two at least which dealt with the substance of the law. Now I happen to share the view that rule of law doesn't involve just procedure and formalities but substance as well. But for the purposes of what I want to say today, that's really not the critical question. There are more fundamental issues to consider. And my primary thesis is that to thrive and prosper, Hong Kong needs not only the engines of economic prosperity, it also needs to observe the rule of law and to be seen to be doing so. Economic prosperity and social cohesion go hand in hand with the rule of law. The rule of law creates conditions for economic growth in which people can have confidence that enterprise will be rewarded and those rewards not arbitrarily removed. It also assists social cohesion by creating a society which is seen to be fair and just. And I'm not therefore surprised both to hear today references to the importance of the rule of law uh, from Mr. Tong and from Dr. Victor Fung just now, but also to read that many Hong Kongers value the rule of law and place it highly amongst the values of this community. And viewed from outside Hong Kong, it is a critical consideration, for example, for foreign investment and business partnerships that Hong Kong should offer impartial application of the law and an effective and trustworthy dispute resolution system to solve civil disputes that the parties can't themselves solve. Those are both elements of the rule of law. So let me just say what I think are the key attributes for these purposes. At its most basic level, the rule of law requires that government is by laws and not by men, that rules should not be arbitrary depending on the whim or will of individuals however prominent, rather that there should be certainty and predictability in law so that citizens and others can guide their conduct. This was the meaning of the first principle of Dicey to which I referred before. It's therefore essential that the law is accessible, it's intelligible, and it's clear and predictable. The same essential principle means that questions of legal right and liability should ordinarily be resolved by the application of the law and not by the exercise of some unfettered discretion. The rule of law also means that there should be equality before the law. The law must apply equally to everyone. And an essential aspect of this universality of application is that the law must apply to the ruler or government as well as to the ordinary citizen. 
And the rule of law requires that all must be subject to the law, including the very highest in the land. Because the rule of law also imposes limits on the way that power is exercised, that authority, that is to say ministers and public officials, at all levels must exercise the powers conferred on them in good faith, fairly, for the purpose for which the powers are conferred without exceeding the limits of authority and not unreasonably. And that's what was meant by the very famous phrase, first coined by an 18th century churchman and historian, Dr. Thomas Fuller, be you never so high, the law is above you. So law isn't there just to regulate the behavior of the citizen, but also to control the exercise of power by public bodies. The delivery of justice therefore includes judicial review of executive action as well as control of the action of individuals. It's critical in the determination of whether an individual has committed an offense that there should be a fair judgment. It's critical in the resolution of disputes between civil parties, between private parties, that the law is determined fairly. And the rule of law therefore requires all these issues to be determined by a suitable judiciary. We would normally say that the judiciary should be competent, honest, and independent. What then does independence of the judiciary mean? But at a recent lecture here in Hong Kong, at the Foreign Correspondence Club, Lord Newberger, who's currently president of the United Kingdom Supreme Court, and also one of Hong Kong's uh, non-permanent judges in the Court of Final Appeal, had this to say about the independence of the judiciary in Hong Kong. He underlined that independence for the judiciary means that the legislature and the executive should not be able either to interfere with or influence judicial decision making or remove judges from office. He also made the important point that Alexander Hamilton, one of the founding fathers of the United States, uh, said when helping to frame the US Constitution that the judiciary is a branch of government, but it's the weakest branch, and therefore special care needs to be taken to guard it against attacks. And I know this from my own experience during my time in government in the United Kingdom. Ministers from time to time uh, wanted to criticize judges' decisions because they found them uh, irksome. But public criticism of judges by ministers is not helpful. Uh, it's not the way that people have confidence in the law. So I was very pleased to see Lord Newberger reject suggestions that the independence of the judiciary in Hong Kong is in fact being undermined. He spoke, given his position as one of the judges of the final court of appeal, with knowledge. He would have had the opportunity to witness and to hear from other judges whether there are issues. His conclusion was clear. I quote what he said. If I felt, he said, that the independence of the judiciary was being undermined, then I would either have to speak out or I would have to resign as a judge. And I believe that the world outside Hong Kong and Hong Kong itself can take much comfort from this, as it can also paradoxically take comfort from the fact that in the course of the actions concerning the Occupy Central demonstrations, a young leader of the protest was freed from detention by a judge granting habeas corpus, which is the ancient common law remedy against unlawful detention, uh, in a matter of hours from when he was seized with the matter. Now, whatever other issues there may be about those events, one can take heart about the independence and robustness of the Hong Kong judiciary that such decisive action was taken in that way. And it's critically important for the future of Hong Kong as an international center for dispute resolution, and I would also say for its continued economic prosperity, that people don't misunderstand the position about the independence of the judiciary in Hong Kong. And this foundation launched today, I would suggest, can help that in two respects. First, by helping to promote the evidence, the positive evidence of judicial independence, such as the incidents I've just referred to, uh, they need to be understood abroad so that people don't doubt that they can get a fair trial and a fair and competent resolution of their civil disputes in Hong Kong. And all the evidence I've seen is that they most certainly can. And in this respect, it's also a great strength of the system of law in Hong Kong that the final court of appeal contains overseas judges of distinction. Judges from Australia and from the United Kingdom, for example, who serve on the court. 
And that gives a strong reassurance that the most important disputes will come before fiercely independent judges for decision. Now, that's not for a moment to suggest, I hasten to say, that the permanent local members of the Hong Kong judiciary are not equally independent, not equally detached in their opinions and decisions as their overseas brothers. But in terms of appearance, the presence of the overseas judges gives much reassurance that cases will be decided objectively and without any partisan element. So the Hong Kong judiciary is a hugely important and impressive statement of Hong Kong's commitment to the rule of law. Secondly, uh, it would help to sensitize others for the foundation to sensitize others to the need not even to give the appearance of undermining that independence. As I've already noted, the judiciary is the weakest arm of government. The rule of law and the independence of the judiciary are therefore precious flowers. But like most flowers, they are fragile and easily bruised. No one should perhaps be surprised that the call in the recent PRC white paper for judges to be uh, patriotic was understood by some as a call for judges to determine their decisions by considerations of what was best for the country rather than by an objective scrutiny of the evidence and of the law. That wouldn't be a correct understanding of what a judge's role is, rather the judge should determine the case in front of him or her on the basis of a scrupulous and unpartisan examination of the law and the evidence. Lord Newberger, in fact, put forward his explanation of why judges could hold her firm to that approach while still being patriotic, emphasizing in that respect that deciding cases in accordance with those principles was precisely the patriotic duty expected of a judge. But that reconciliation notwithstanding, the episode shows the fears and the risks to the rule of law if the wrong idea is circulated. So in addition to pointing to the evidence of robust and independent judicial action, and in recognition of how fragile and vulnerable is the flower of judicial independence, I hope that the, the Foundation might counsel great care is taken in statements, especially about the role of judges, which could be taken the wrong way. What, finally, about the observance of law by others? Is requiring observance of the general law a part of the rule of law? Well, it's true that most analysis of the rule of law looks at the role of governments and public authorities, and that's not surprising. This is the area of the greatest importance because the rule of law is a bulwark against arbitrary government rather than seen as a method of enforcing obligations on the majority of the population. So the list of elements of the rule of law will normally be considered from the standpoint of the accountability of the state and public bodies. What's more, the fact that people break the law, which sadly in all countries is constantly happening, doesn't mean that such country is not subject to the rule of law. If there are people in a country, mine, United Kingdom, who rob or harm or murder, you can't say that such a country doesn't follow the rule of law. What matters in those circumstances is how law-breaking is dealt with. And the rule of law requires that penalization for breach of law should be determined by tribunals acting objectively and fairly, applying their own dispassionate judgment to the case, not, of course, being dictated to by powerful interests. Inevitably, that means final decision should only be taken after hearing from both sides of a dispute. But once that's happened, the law must be allowed to take its course and respect it. Respect for the law is not a one-way street. It's a two-way street. And as the law applies to the state, so, of course, it applies to the citizen and those within the state. Now, I'm aware that some might interpret those remarks as directly applicable to the current state in relation to injunctions in relation to the Occupy Central uh, issue. They shouldn't be taken as expressions of my view on that. It would be wrong for me on several counts to do that, not least because uh, this is a matter for the court, which is about to rule on some of these matters. Uh, but I will say this, that when judicial orders are made, unless the court grants a stay of its order, then those decisions need to be respected. And a system based on law can allow nothing less. Thank you. Thank you.